Operation Gearbox June 30, September 17, 1942 was a Norwegian and British operation on the Arctic island of Spitsbergen in the Svalbard archipelago during the Second World War. Operation Fritham, an earlier expedition in two ships, arrived on May 13 but met disaster after being spotted by a Luftwaffe Ju-88. Next day, four FW-200 reconnaissance bombers attacked and killed 14 men, including Einar Sverdrup, the commander. Eleven men were wounded, two mortally, one ship was sunk and the other set on fire. The survivors salvaged what equipment they could and set up camp in Barentsburg, which had been deserted since Operation Gauntlet August 25, September 3, 1941 and sent out reconnaissance parties. The Admiralty arranged a reconnaissance flight by a RAF Coastal Command Catalina flying boat but already knew much of what had happened, through ultra-decrypts of Luftwaffe Enigma-coded wireless signals. Operation Gearbox, 57 Norwegians with 116 long tons 118 T of supplies arrived by cruiser on July 2, to supersede Operation Freedom. The reinforcements consolidated the Barentsburg defenses and sent parties to attack the German weather party at Longyearbyen on July 12 only to find that they had departed three days earlier. The airstrip was blocked and on July 23, a Ju-88, carrying an experienced crew and two senior officials, was shot down while flying low over the landing ground. In the operation, Norwegian sovereignty had been asserted, no casualties had been suffered, the German plan to send another weather party had been thwarted and preparations had begun for Operation Gearbox 2. Background Svalbar Main article Svalbar the Svalbard archipelago is in the Arctic Ocean 650 miles 1050 kilometers from the North Pole. The islands are mountainous, with permanently snow-covered peaks, some glaciated, there are occasional river terraces at the bottom of steep valleys and some coastal plains. In winter, the islands are covered in snow and the bays ice over. Spitsbergen Island has several large fjords along its west coast and this Jordan is up to 10 miles 16 kilometers wide. The Gulf Stream warms the waters and the sea is ice-free during the summer. Settlements were established at long nearby in Barentsburg and inlets along the south shore of Isf Jordan, in Kings Bay quite hot further north along the coast and in Van Mijen 4 to the south. The settlements attracted colonists of different nationalities and the Treaty of 1920 neutralized the islands and recognized the mineral and fishing rights of the participating countries. Before 1939, the population consisted of about 3,000 mostly Norwegian and Russian people, who worked in the mining industry. Drift mines were linked to the shore by overhead cable tracks or rails and coal dumped over the winter was collected by ship after the summer thaw. By 1939 production was about 500,000 long tons 508,000 in 23 t a year, split between Norway and Russia. Signals Intelligence Main articles Ultra and Bedienst the British government code and cipher school GCCS based at Bletchley Park housed a small industry of code breakers and traffic analysts. By June 1941, the German Enigma machine home waters Heimisch settings used by surface ships and U-boats could quickly be read. On February 1, 1942, the Enigma machines used in U-boats in the Atlantic and Mediterranean were changed but German ships in the U-boats in Arctic waters continued with the older Heimisch herder from 1942, Dolphin to the British. By mid-1941, British Y stations were able to receive and read Luftwaffe W-T transmissions and give advanced warning of Luftwaffe operations. In 1941, interception parties codenamed Headaches were embarked on warships and from May 1942, computers sailed with the cruiser admirals in command of convoy escorts to read Luftwaffe W-T signals which could not be intercepted by land stations in Britain. The Admiralty sent details of Luftwaffe wireless frequencies, call signs, and the daily local codes to the computers. Combined with their knowledge of Luftwaffe procedures, the computers could give fairly accurate details of German reconnaissance sorties and sometimes predicted attacks 20 minutes before they were detected by radar. In February 1942, the German Beobacht Tumstdienst Bedienst, Observation Service of the Kriegsmarine Marin and Akrichtendienst NND. Naval Intelligence Service broke Naval Cipher No. 3 and was able to read it until January 1943. Naval Operations, 1940-1941 The Germans left the Svalbard Islands alone during the invasion of Norway in 1940 and apart from a few Norwegians taking passage on Allied ships, little changed. Wireless stations on the islands continued to broadcast weather reports. From July 25 to August 9, 1940, 
The Admiral Hipper sailed from Trondheim to search the area from Troms to Bear Island and Svalbard to intercept British ships returning from Petsamo but found only a Finnish freighter. On July 12, 1941, the Admiralty was ordered to assemble a force of ships to operate in the Arctic in cooperation with the USSR, despite objections from Admiral John Jack Toby, commander of the Home Fleet, who preferred to operate further south where there were more targets and better air cover. Rear Admirals Philip Vian and Geoffrey Miles flew to Pagliarno and Miles established a British military mission in Moscow. Vian reported that Murmansk was close to German-held territory, that its air defenses were inadequate and that the prospects of offensive operations on German shipping were poor. Vian was sent to look at the west coast of Spitsbergen, the main island of Svalbard, which was mostly ice-free and 450 miles 720 kilometers from northern Norway, to assess its potential as a base. The cruisers HMS Nigeria, HMS Aurora, and two destroyers departed Iceland on July 27 but Vian judged the apparent advantages of Spitsbergen as a base to be mistaken. The force closed on the Norwegian coast twice and each time was discovered by Luftwaffe reconnaissance aircraft. Operation Gauntlet Main Articles Operation Gauntlet and Operation Dervish 1941 As Operation Dervish, the first Arctic convoy, was assembling in Iceland. Vian sailed with Force A for Svalbard on August 19 in Operation Gauntlet. Norwegian and Russian civilians were to be evacuated using the same two cruisers, with five destroyer escorts, an oiler, and RMS Empress of Canada, a troop transport carrying 645 men, mainly Canadian infantry. The expedition landed at Barentsburg to sabotage the coal industry, evacuate the Norwegian and Soviet civilians, and commandeer any shipping that could be found. About 2,000 Russians were taken to Arkhangelsk in Empress of Canada, escorted by one of the cruisers and the three destroyers, which rendezvoused with the rest of Force A off Barentsburg on September 1. Normal business was kept up at the Barentsburg wireless station by the Norwegian military governor-designate, Lieutenant Ragnvald Tambor. Three colliers sent from the mainland were hijacked along with the SEAL ship MS Celis, the icebreaker SS Istjern, a tug, and two fishing boats. The Canadian landing parties re-embarked on September 2 and the force sailed for home on September 3, with 800 Norwegian civilians and the prizes. The two cruisers diverted towards the Norwegian coast to hunt for German ships and in stormy weather and poor visibility early on September 7, found a German convoy off Port Shamir near the North Cape. The cruisers sank the training ship Brahms but two troop transports, with 1,500 men aboard, escaped. Nigeria was damaged. Thought to have hit a wreck, but the naval force reached stop a flow on 10 September. B. Operation Bands 1941-1942. After Operation Gauntlet, August 25, September 3, 1941, the British had expected the Germans to occupy Svalbard as a base for attacks on Arctic convoys. The Germans were more interested in meteorological data, the Arctic being the origin of much of the weather over Western Europe. By August 1941, the Allies had eliminated German weather stations on Greenland, Jan Mayen Island, Bear Island Vernia in the civil weather reports from Spitsbergen. The Germans used weather reports from U-boats, reconnaissance aircraft, trawlers, and other ships but these were too vulnerable to attack. The Kriegsmarine and the Luftwaffe surveyed land sites for weather stations in the range of sea and air supply, some to be manned and others automatic. Wetterer Kundungstate 5 would cost a 5 part of Luftflot 5, was based at Bannock in northern Norway. Once it was ready, the He 111s and Ju 88s of Wukusta 5 ranged over the Arctic Ocean, past Spitsbergen and Jan Mayen, towards Greenland. The experience gained made the unit capable of the transport and supply of manned and automatic weather stations. After the wireless on Spitsbergen had mysteriously ceased transmission in early September, German reconnaissance flights from Bannock discovered the Canadian demolitions, burning coal dumps, and saw one man, a conscientious objector who had refused to leave, waving to them. Dr. Eric Etienne, a former polar explorer, commanded an operation to install a manned station on the islands but with winter imminent, time was short. Advent Bay at Ventforden was chosen for its broad valley, making a safer approach for aircraft, its subsoil of alluvial gravel was acceptable for a landing ground. The southeastern orientation of the high ground did not impede wireless communication with Bannock and the settlement of Longyear by and Longyear Town was close by. A northwest to southeast airstrip about 1,800 by 250 YD 1,650 by 230 M was marked out, which was firm when dry and hard when frozen but liable to become boggy after rain in the spring thaw. The Germans used the Hans Lund hunt as a control room and wireless station, 
the inner Jordham hut to the southeast being prepared as a substitute. The site received the codename bands from Bannock and Spitsbergenia and ferry flights of men, equipment, and supplies began on September 25th. He won 11, Jew 88, and Jew 52 pilots gained experience of landing on soft ground, cut with ruts and boulders. The British followed events from Bletchley Park through Ultra, made easier by German willingness to make routine use of radio communication. Four British minesweepers en route from Archangelsk were diverted to investigate and reached Asf Jordan on October 19. A Wacosta 5 aircraft crew spotted the ships as they prepared to land and the 30-minute bands quickly were flown to safety by the aircraft and two Ju-52 transport aircraft. Bands was deserted when the British arrived but some code books were recovered, when the ships left, the Germans returned. After 38 supply flights, Dr. Albrecht Mahl and three men arrived to spend the winter of 1941-1942 transmitting weather reports. On October 29, 1941, Hans Noespel and five weathermen were installed by the Kriegsmarine at Liliac Fjorden, a branch of Cross Fjord in the northwestern Spitsbergen. Sea landing aircraft was riskier in winter, when the landing ground or an ice covered bay was frozen solid, because soft snow on top could pile up in front of the wheels of the aircraft and jerk it to a stop or prevent it from reaching takeoff speed when departing. The blanket of snow could also cover holes, into which a wheel could fall, potentially to damage the undercarriage or propeller. The mall party at Bands called for aircraft when the weather was adequate and after making low and slow passes, to check the landing ground for obstructions, the pilot decided whether to land. On May 2, 1942, the apparatus for an automatic weather station, a thermometer, barometer, transmitter, and batteries arrived at Bannock, in a box named Kurt A. Toad by the aircrew. As soon as weather permitted, it was to be flown to Bands and the mall party brought back. It took until May 12 for a favorable weather report to reach Bannock and a He-111 and a Ju-88 were sent with supplies and the technicians to install the Corte. The aircraft reached Bands at 5.45 a.m. and after a careful examination of the ground, the Heigl pilot eventually landed, keeping its tail well up out of the snow. The main wheels quickly accumulated a drift of back snow in front of them and the aircraft almost nosed over. The 10 crew and passengers joined the ground party, who welcomed them having been alone for six months. The Ju-88 pilot was warned off by a flare and returned to Bannock. Operation Fritham On April 30, 1942, Isk Jernan Lieutenant H.I. Royal Norwegian Navy and about 20 crewmen sailed from Greenock with a Norwegian landing party of 60 men, accompanied by three British liaison officers. Each ship carried a 20mm Erlikon anti-aircraft gun but none of the party had been trained in their use. Major Angers Twatman, a polar explorer and signal specialist, repaired and operated the wireless set but it broke down on the journey to Iceland and was not reliable for the rest of the voyage. The ships hugged the polar ice, with little risk of being seen by Luftwaffe aircraft, once northeast of Jan Mayen. The ships reached Svalbard on May 13 and entered as Jordan at 8 p.m. Gernford and Greenfjord or Green Harbor to the British was covered in ice up to 4 feet 1.2 and thick. The ice breaking was delayed until after midnight on May 14 and parties were sent to scout Barentsburg on the east shore in the Finneset Peninsula. The scouting parties found no one but took until 5 p.m. to get back, by when Estgern had cut a long channel in the ice but was still well short of Finneset. A Ju-88 flew along as Fjorden, also at 5 p.m. but Sverdrup insisted on making for the landing stage at Barentsburg to unload quicker. At 8.30 p.m., Four FW-200 Condor long-range reconnaissance bombers appeared. The valley sides were so high that the bombers arrived without warning and the third bomber hit his jern which sank immediately and Celis was soon set on fire. Thirteen men were killed, including Sverdrup and Godfrey, nine men were wounded, two mortally. The equipment in his jern, arms, ammunition, food, clothes, and the wireless had been lost. Barentsburg was only a few hundred yards across the ice and plenty of food was found because it was the Svalbard custom to stock up before winter. The local swine herd has been slaughtered during gauntlet and the Arctic cold had preserved the meat, wild duck could be plundered for eggs and an infirmary was also found, still stocked with dressings for the wounded. June 88 and he 111 bombers returned on May 15 but the survivors took cover in mine shafts. The fitter men at Barentsburg tended the wounded and lay low when the Luftwaffe was around. Lieutenant Overall Lund sent parties south to Sviagrubi and Van Meijenfort and to reconnoiter the Germans in Advent Bay around the airstrip at Bands. Prelude Plan After convoy PQ 162130 May 1942 Air Chief Marshal Philip Joubert, the AOC Coastal Command, 
mindful of the like of aircraft carriers and the limited help available from the Soviet Air Force's VVS. Vojano Hozdishny Sili suggested that a flying boat base be established on Spitsbergen. Because of the remoteness of Svalbard, the inevitable frequent grounding of aircraft during bad weather and the troubles encountered by Operation Fritham, the Admiralty rejected the idea. Joubert also suggested basing flying boats in North Russia and eight Catalinas from 210 Squadron and 240 Squadron were sent to fly from the Kola Inlet and Late Lakta for convoy PQ-17 June 27 July 10 the next convoy operation. Joubert also proposed to send a force of torpedo bombers to Bayana but this was vetoed by the Admiralty for lack of aircraft. At the end of June, Glenn delivered his report to the Admiralty, describing the calamity of May 14, the strength of the German party at Bands and the prospects of achieving the objectives of Fritham by sending reinforcements. Glenn predicted that the German weather party would be replaced by an automatic weather reporting device and that the Luftwaffe would increase the number of weather reconnaissance flights over the Arctic. The Admiralty decided to press on, Fritham was to be terminated and replaced by Operation Gearbox. To avoid another disaster, the occupation of Spitsbergen was to remain under the command of Norwegian government forces but the Navy would be responsible for delivering supplies and the trips were to be synchronized with outbound PQ convoys. The cruiser HMS Manchester and the destroyer HMS Eclipse were to begin gearbox by carrying 57 Norwegian reinforcements Lt. Goodham and 2nd Lt. K. Knudsen and 116.6 long tons 118.5 T of stores to Spitsbergen. Catalina Flights, 25-27 June the Admiralty sent Glenn and the pilot, Flight Lieutenant D.E. Tim Healy, to brief Vice Admiral S.S. Bombham Carter, commander of the 18th Cruiser Squadron at Greenock in Scotland and were asked to photograph the Spitsbergen coast from about 100 feet 30 m to simulate the view from Manchester's bridge. Healy and Glenn described the pier at Barentsburg, which was silted up but had a crane and said that ice flows might float past in a southerly breeze and Healy agreed to take some vertical photographs of the pier. Glenn and Croft were due to return to Spitsbergen on June 26 and were going to signal to Manchester when it arrived with Eclipse on July 1, with a report of the latest Luftwaffe activity. P. Peter took off from Selimbo at 1.21 p.m. and headed for Iceland for another ice reconnaissance, being shot at by British trawlers on the way. At 6.32 p.m. the crew made course for Greenland, eventually seeing pack ice through the fog. The Catalina flew into Scoresby Sound and the crew photographed 200 NMI 230 miles, 370 km northwards to Cape Brewster, turned for Iceland at 11.30 p.m. and flew in clear weather almost to the island before the fog closed in again, landing at Accuraria at 2.35 a.m. on June 26. The ice and weather reports were transmitted and P. Peter took off at 11.50 p.m. for Jan Main, thence to Spitsbergen, making landfall at 8.10 a.m. The crew descended to 100 feet 30 m to take photographs in clear weather then turned east for Bell Sound and photographed Van Mijen fired in low sound, a prospective anchorage for tankers, examining Sviagrova, which seemed unoccupied. The crew took pictures of the coast to Cape Lynn, Green Harbor, and Barentsburg, made contact with Fritham Force and then photographed the pier, the navigator hanging out of the port blister and held fast by a colleague. Healy landed P. Peter, deposited Glenn and Croft into a boat and took off for Advent Bay to check on the Germans. There was no snow around long nearby and but tracks could be seen near the airstrip, which were followed to an aircraft near a hut with piles of equipment and a lorry nearby. The Catalina gunners got ready and engaged what turned out to be a Ju-88 with 1,500 rounds of machine gun fire and photographed the attack with CIN and still cameras, smoke coming out of the tail of the Ju-88. The Catalina crew dropped a message to the ground party as they flew back and set a middling course for Shetland and Iceland, ignoring the itinerary for Jan Mayen. At 6.32 p.m. a weather signal revealed that Selangvo was too foggy and the crew set course for Iceland, eventually to see Cape Langanis and coast crawl to land at age at Fjord at 11.40 p.m. d. Luftwaffe, June 14, July 3. The mall party at Bands had reported a British flight of May 26 and on June 12 reported that the landing ground was dry enough for a landing attempt. A Ju-88 flew to the island and landed but damaged its propellers as it taxied, stranding the crew and increasing the German party to 18 men. Luftwaffe and aircraft flew to Spitsbergen each day but were warned off each time. The Germans thought about using floatplanes but the east end of us, Jordan and Advent Bay were too full of drifting ice and the idea was dropped. In the midnight Sunday April 20th August 22nd as midsummer approached, the ice in the west of the fjord near the Allied positions cleared faster than that by the Germans in the east end. 
The Germans reported the Catalina attack on the Ju-88 on June 27, which had left it a write-off and claimed to have damaged the British aircraft with return fire. On June 30, the party sent a message that the airstrip was dry enough for Junkers Ju-52 aircraft to land and supply flights were resumed. The aircraft were watched by a Norwegian party which had gone on an abortive expedition to destroy the German headquarters at the Hans Lund hut. On clear days the German pilots flew direct over the mountains but when visibility was poor, they took the coast route past Barentsburg. Operation Gearbox June 28, July 5 Manchester and Eclipse left the Clyde for Scapa flow on June 25 with Operation Gearbox, the Norwegian party to reinforce Fritham Force, embarked. The ships arrived at Citus Fort in Iceland on June 28 and met the pilot and navigator of Catalina P. Peter, who had flown the special reconnaissance to Spitsbergen, to be briefed. The cruiser delayed departure until June 30 to appear part of the escort force of PQ-17, if sighted by a U-boat near Jammayan. The polar ice formed an inverted funnel, with the left side, south of Jammayan, curving northeast to just north of Isf Jordan and the right side, south of Bear Island curving northwest to the southern entrance to Asf Jordan. The ship steamed northwards up the funnel and then turned east to approach Asf Jordan from the west. Eclipse was refueled on July 1st, during a thick fog and at 8.38 a.m. on July 2nd, the bridge crew sighted the fjord in excellent visibility. Off Barentsburg at noon, the ships received a welcome signal from Fritham Force that a Luftwaffe aircraft flew a daily reconnaissance at 3 a.m. and sometimes one at 2 p.m. but no sea or ground forces had appeared. In clear weather, German aircraft flew direct over the mountains and in poor weather followed the coast past Barentsburg, which had led to the discovery of Ispjern and Celis. The pier was too silty to moor, the ships kept their engines running and the crews at anti-aircraft stations as ships' boats, motorboats, the motor dinghy, a pinnace, cutters, and whalers made 121 round trips in six hours, unloading the Norwegians and the supplies, including shortwave wireless. Both for 40mm anti-aircraft guns, skis, sledges, and other Arctic warfare equipment. Croft, I and 11 other men of the Fritham party were taken on board and by 7 p.m. the ships had departed. The men ashore quickly eliminated any sign of the visit, cranes were pulled back from the quay, boats hidden and the stores camouflaged. Unlike Sverdrup, whose brief was primarily economic, Ullering had been ordered to reclaim Norwegian sovereignty over the Svalbard Islands. He found a bomb settlement with frozen livestock scattered around, under a pall of smoke from the smoldering coal dumps. To the dismay of the gearbox party, their cold machine guns were found to have no ammunition belts, leaving only the 20mm Ehrlichons and N2 Browning machine guns. On July 3, an aircraft was heard flying along as Jordan and back again an hour later, thought to have landed at Long Yerbyan, later a Ju-52 was seen following the same route. By July 5, four Ehrlichons and four Brownings had been installed and the gun crews rehearsed. 614 July On July 12, the supply trip from 210 Squadron was to deliver the missing cold ammunition belts to Barentsburg, before conducting a reconnaissance of the Barents Sea to search for survivors of convoy PQ-17 which has lost 24 ships. On departing Barentsburg, the Catalina was to fly 100 NMI 120 miles. 190 kilometers east of Sirkap South Cape to Hope and Hope Island and then east along the polar ice as far as possible and then turn south to North Russia. After resting the crew was to fly back to the polar ice where they had left off and then fly east again to 78 north, halfway between Novaya Zemlya and Fromm's Joseph Land, thence to return to Russia via Cape Nassau. Catalina in November FLT slash LTGG Poder departed Sulambo at 1.59 p.m. on July 13 and reached Barentsburg at 12.25 a.m. On July 14, only to be hit with machine gun fire in the tail and wind by mistake. The Catalina landed for 10 minutes to offload supplies and then flew on to Hopen at 200 feet 61 m under the cloud. E. 1529 July Once the cold parts had been delivered, Unlering had one mounted in a cutter and on July 15, set off in the midnight sun with 10 men, to attack the Germans at Longyearbyen in Advent Bay. The last Germans on Spitsbergen including the weather reporting party that had been in residence since late 1941, had been flown back to Norway on July 9. The Germans had gone but the Ju-88 shot up on July 1 was still there, the wireless transmitter and other equipment were operational, stores were plentiful and the buildings used by the party were in good condition, suggesting that the German departure was not permanent. 
The crew near the shore at Jordan was found, dismantled, and returned to Barentsburg for shipment to Britain and a party with two Colt and two Browning machine guns were was left behind to guard the airstrip. A Ju-88 was sent from Norway to investigate the cessation of transmissions from the Kurde on July 20. The crew saw that the base had been destroyed and found themselves under machine gun fire from the Norwegians. The party at Sviagruva heard the bomber pass overhead and assumed that the base at Bannock had been alerted. On July 21, a Ju-88, flying over Green Harbor was fired on by the Ehrlichon gunners, the port engine trailed smoke and a hole appeared in one of the wind tips. German records showed that the Germans judged the landing ground was too boggy for safe landings in the summer. As a precaution against a surprise landing, the ground markers were removed, several trenches were dug and obstacles were strewn over the strip. Another transmitter and some stores were found in Adventdalen and Ulling sailed south to Belsund Belsound, Van Meijenford, and Braganza Bay to deliver arms to the Frithen Force Party and take nine of them to reinforce Marinsburg. At Bannock, Dr. Eric Atien, who had supervised the weather data operation in Major Valrith Weibel arranged a reconnaissance flight to Spitsbergen. A Ju-88 of Wetterkundenstaffel 5 Weather Squadron 5 flew the sortie over Advent Bay on July 23 to reconnoiter the extent of the Allied interference with the Corte. As the aircraft flew low towards Jordham and made a steep turn, Nix Langback a Silas gunner, fired 10 rounds from a Colt machine gun and the bomber crashed and exploded, two rounds had hit one of the engines. The area around Highworth fell it had several coal transporter cables and the Ju-88 might have collided with one after being hit, the crew were buried in code books salvaged from the wreckage. 30 July-August The loss of an experienced crew and the passengers led to the Germans sending several more flights but they were able only to see that the band's airstrip had been occupied and that they lacked the forces necessary to recapture the site. The Norwegians had recovered signals information and code books and had suffered no more casualties. Wattman and the wireless operators were sending copious amounts of information to the Admiralty and on July 29, Catalina P. Peter flew Tetanus anti-taxon and other items to Operation Gearbox and returned with Glenn on July 30 to visit the Admiralty for discussions about the forthcoming Operation Gearbox 2 and Convoy PQ-18. Glenn was satisfied that the Norwegian hold on his Jordan and Green Harbor was sufficiently secure to use it as a seaplane base. At the beginning of August, Unlearning took a party of nine men north along the coast into Kongsfjord and Kingsford in the Cutter, to look for another German weather station but found only a footprint. On August 20th, a U-boat entered as Jordan and bombarded shore installations in Green Harbor and Advent Day with its deck gun. At Barentsburg, the Norwegians returned fire from the Cutter armed with the cold machine gun, which was moored at the pier and with an early con aim placed on the rise beyond the village, forcing the U-boat to fire from longer range, the Norwegians again suffered no casualties. Aftermath Analysis The remainder of Freedom Force at Barentsburg was consolidated by the reinforcements of Operation Gearbox and its sequels, a weather station was set up and wireless contact with the Admiralty regained. Ullering reported the oversight with the Colt machine guns, arranged for Catalina supply flights, provided weather and sighting reports, protected Warman and his apparatus for research into the ionosphere and prepared to attack German weather stations wherever they could be found. The survivors of Operation Fritham provided excellent local knowledge and with the arrival of the gearbox personnel, could do more than subsist in dodge attacks by German aircraft. The flight of Catalina and Nuts to Spitsbergen on July 13 with the cold parts and other supplies, thence to North Russia to search for PQ-17 survivors, informed the British naval authorities in Nurmansk that the Barents Sea was free of ice, many survivors were rescued and ship sheltering at Novaya Zemlya were escorted safely to port. Planning began at the Admiralty for Operation Gearbox 2, the sequel to Gearbox and with Operation Order, part of the forthcoming convoy PQ-18. Subsequent Operations Operation Gearbox 2 After the calamity of convoy PQ-17, Joubert resubmitted the torpedo bomber proposal, which was accepted and took place as Operation Order. During PQ-18-221 September 1942 Force B, the fleet oilers RFA Blue Ranger and RFA Oligarch and Fort Destroyer Escort sailed on September 3 for Spitsbergen and anchored in Low Sound, along Van Mijen and Forden, as an advanced refueling party. From 9 to September 13, destroyers were detached from PQ-18 to refuel. Operation Gearbox 2 began with another supply run by the cruiser HMS Cumberland, Eclipse, and four more destroyer escorts, which arrived on September 17 with 130 long tons 132t of supplies and a party of Norwegian troops Lieutenant Colonel Albert Tornerud and military governor in place of Ullering, 
HMS Sheffield arrived the next day with another 110 long tons 112 t of stores. The ships repeated the practice of keeping their engines running and the crews closed up for anti-aircraft action, unloading and departing in six hours each time. The ships delivered two husky teams with 40 dogs, three Bofors guns, two forts and tractors, boats, wireless equipment, and winter supplies. Healy took part in Operation Order and left Grasnea on September 25 to return to Scotland via Svalbard to pick up Glenn. Bad weather forced a return to Murmansk and at 1.29 p.m., about 70 NMI 81 miles, 130 kilometers out from the coast, Healy was killed in an engagement with a Ju-88. On October 19, HMS Argonaut and two destroyers delivered supplies and a Norwegian vessel made the voyage in November. On June 7, 1943, Cumberland, HMS Bermuda and two destroyers sailed from Iceland and landed men and supplies at Spitsbergen on July 10th.